I'm so sorry, Debbie, you caught me. That's in me. I'm so sorry. Dashwood, carried away so suddenly, woke one morning with a fever and drew his last breath within the week. Poor Mr. Dashwood. Poor Mr. Dashwood. What a very handsome funeral. The serenity of the corpse was most delightful. Poor Mr. Dashwood. Poor Mr. Dashwood. Poor Mrs. Dashwood in every sense of the word. You know his widow and daughters were left with almost nothing? <gasps> Not truly! But Norland Park is such a large estate! Were there many uh, deaths in the family? No, nothing like that! What's question of the law? Did someone break the law? Oh, no, no! Mr. Dashwood... <sighs> Mr. Dashwood could not legally bequeath it to the ladies. It all went to his son from the previous marriage, Mr. John Dashwood. But wasn't he a rich man already? Oh, yes! He married in the money, but his wife, not a sympathetic creature, moved into Northern Park the day after the funeral without a word of notice to the new widow. I think that I will give them a thousand pounds apiece to start their new life. My dear John, how can you think of taking four thousand pounds from the fortune of our dear little boy? What possible claims can the Miss Dashwoods, who are only related to you by half-blood, have to so large an amount? My father's last request was that I provide for them, Fanny. Your father did not know what he was talking of, I dare say. Ten to one he was light-headed at the time. Four thousand pounds? He did not specify any particular amount. Perhaps, if the sum were to be diminished by one half, 500 pounds apiece would certainly be a great increase to their fortune. 2,000 pounds? What brother on earth would do so much for even his real sisters? One had rather do too much than too little. Do you think they may expect more? Who knows what they may expect? Two thousand pounds, all at once, might overwhelm them and be spent unwisely, I suppose. Perhaps a yearly sum instead. People always live forever when there is an annuity to be paid them. <laughs> to be very honest, my love, I am convinced your father had no intention of you giving them any money. I wager when he told you to provide for them. He only meant for you to help move out their things and send them occasional presents of fish and game and so forth. My love, may I risk being perfectly frank? Always, my angel. The painful truth is that even on his deathbed, your father did not think of us, nor of our little Harry. He only thought of them, so you owe no particular attention to his wishes. For given his way, you would have left them everything in the world. Remember, my dear, he left them all the best china. Hmm. The china is a material consideration. It is absolutely unnecessary, I think, to do anything more than help them move comfortably. How liberal and handsome you are, my lamb. And so, the young ladies and their mother are left in such reduced circumstances. Shall the girls ever catch a man? As to that, I understand Mrs. John Dashwood's brother, Mr. Edward Ferris, is to stay with his sister in Norwood for a time. He is a bachelor. And stands to inherit a large fortune from his mother. If only one of the Dashwoods can make a position.
please do excuse me. Uh, Mr. Ferris? Miss Dashwood, please pardon me. I, I did not intend to intrude. Oh, no, you weren't, um, intruding. Are you... Uh, yes! I am. Writing. A letter, yes. Oh, I see, are you as well? I am, <laughs> yes! <laughs> Writing. A letter. Um, uh, pray, do not leave on my account. That is, um, uh, the light. It's, uh, it's very good here. Miss Dashwood, I fear I have not yet had the proper occasion to express to you, most sincerely, my condolences on the loss of your father. Oh, yes. Thank you. Miss Dashwood, I hope my presence here has not caused you any additional distress in this sad time. My sis... I must confess I was not aware of all the particular... Particulars before my visit. Oh, no. You needn't apologize, Mr. Ferris. In fact, I must thank you. My mother said only yesterday that your presence at Nolan is a comfort, and I am grateful for anything that raises her spirits. I am pleased that your mother is pleased. Uh, uh, that is to say, may I inquire after Mrs. Dashwood? It is rather too early to think of any moderation in grief. My father's death has been very difficult. I'm sure you must be a great comfort to her. I attempt to be. I'm writing to our cousin, Sir John Middleton. He may have a cottage available for us in Devonshire. The rent is uncommonly moderate. It must be very difficult to leave your home. We... We have been... very, um... happy here. Oh, Miss Dashwood, please, please forgive me. I, oh, please, uh, please forgive me. I did not mean to upset you. Mr. Ferris, I cannot use this. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's really, it's all no, right. It's right. You try to your best. Honestly, it's cannot. really all right. <gasps> oh, Fanny, uh, Miss Ashwood was just kind enough. Edward, there is ink on your face. Dusk, conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the nature... With spirit, Edward. With enterprises of great... Edward, please. Hamlet is not making polite conversation. In this speech, he is all of mankind, all of humankind, railing against the forces that would keep us tame, that prevent us from acting upon our soul's truest impulses. It is a desperate cry against the futility of a life less than entirely lived. You must be driven almost mad by passion, by rage, by love for the frail beauty of life itself. With this regard, the current story... <laughs> Shakespeare writes in a rhythm, one which matches precisely the beats of a human heart. 
if your heart also beats, which I presume it does, <laughs> yes. then you cannot help but to feel the impossible depth of all of Hamlet's text. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er the pale cast of light. With this regard, the currents turn away. Oh. Soft you now, the fair <laughs> Soft you now, the fair Ophelia. Live in my own my, my sons, be all my sins remembered. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> A noble effort. <laughs> Why would you give him Hamlet to begin, Marianne? Hey, Mama, if one is not to be animated by Hamlet, but I suppose we must allow for differences of taste. In truth, you have done me service. I may now tell my mother in all seriousness that I have no talent for public speaking. Will she take such a defeat willingly, Edward? Your sister's always telling us you're destined to be a very great orator. My life's work seems to be convinced both Fanny and my mother that I am unsuited for public scrutiny. Well then, however is your fame to be established? For famous you must be to satisfy them. Uh, I cannot be forced into greatness, thank heaven. And do you have no ambition? My ambition? It's to be happy. Mm. But wealth and fame, they will not make me so. Strange that it would. What has wealth or fame to do with being happy? Wealth has much to do with it. Eleanor, for shame. Money determines more than you might wish, Marianne. Edward! You promised you'd show me Fancy's new puppies before dinner. <laughs> I did. Shall we make a party up? I've seen them already. <laughs> it must be a quick visit, Margaret. Oh, and please do wear your boots. It's raining. I don't know where they are. It's scarcely raining, Mama. Let us ask Betsy if they've been laid aside. What a pity it is, Eleanor, that Edward reads so spiritlessly. <laughs> Marianne, you've been hectoring him all afternoon. I'm sure if you left him alone for just a moment, he'd be very well indeed. I was only trying to help. Mm. Eleanor, are you truly offended? <laughs> Do you really think him spiritless? I have the highest opinion possible of Edward, I assure you. I think him everything in the world that is worthy and amiable. Must you always speak so warm? Don't you agree? I think that he's very sensible. He has an excellent mind and even if he is not the most brilliant orator, it is only his shyness that impedes him. <laughs> Indeed. He may sometimes appear awkward, but I believe that is because he strives so earnestly to never hurt any living creature through careless thought or action. Yes? I grant you, perhaps, he is not the most fashionable. No. <laughs> <laughs> he may not even widely be considered handsome, but once you notice his eyes, which are uncommonly good, and the general sweetness of his expression. Well, I think that he's very handsome indeed. <laughs> but what say you, Marianne? I swear that when you tell me to love him as a brother, I shall think him perfect indeed. <laughs> Marianne, I do not deny that I think very highly of him, that I greatly esteem him, that I like him. Like him? Esteem him? Cold-hearted Eleanor. <laughs> well, excuse me and speak in so quiet way of my feelings. Believe them to be more than I have declared. But I do not think Mr. Ferris thinks anything for me beyond friendship. Eleanor. He may have a kind of a preference. Uh -huh. But there are points to be considered, Marianne. Edward is dependent entirely on his mother for a living and must obey her wishes in all things. He would face many obstacles if he wished to marry a woman of no fortune. Dinner is served. You must not be diffident, Eleanor. Edward is obviously desperately in love with you, and no material obstacle can stand in the way of love for long. Which means it's only a matter of time before... Before... Before he binds his soul to yours forever! <laughs> Mary Ann! <laughs> you must stop! You are a goose! There was a white one and a brown one, and an almost all white one with a brown spot on his ear. They were oh so sweet. Do you think, Mama, I'm able to have one as a particular pet? She could sleep in the barn. We shall see, my dear. I do not know how much room we shall have in the new house. How fortunate, ma'am, that you were able to find lodging so soon. Mm. We are very sorry to lose you, of course. When exactly are you planning to move? Uh, well, I might have immediate possession of the cottage, but I imagine it will be some months before we put all the particulars to right. I do not find it right that you are to move so far away. Not too far for a visit. Fanny, 
you and John will always be welcome. And Edward, I do hope you will come and visit us very soon. Yes, I, I will. <laughs> certainly. I, I, I will certainly visit soon. But not too soon, Edward. You would not want to cut short your visit here. You have so many obligations. You know Mama expects you next month when Miss Morton is visiting. I am not even acquainted with Miss Morton. Fanny, I am sure I can manage both. Edward, do not make promises you cannot keep. My brother, you know, is soft-hearted and wishes to please everybody at every time. But we must not allow him to become too distracted. We have such great expectations for him, whether it's in the law, the government, or the army. Here, here. But it is quite burdensome to have such very, very high potential as our Edward does. It, I confess, it does make me fear for him. What do you mean, my love? Why, my poor brother's a fox, and hallowing around him are hunters and hounds. Ah, uh, ah, uh, A fox, Fanny? Oh, I am sorry. Am I being very abstract? He is a target, my love. He is prey. Opportunists are always circling, eager to pounce. An eligible man in my brother's statue will always attract, for example, upwardly minded young ladies. <clears throat> there is truly no predator so fierce, so creature, so shameless as an unmarried woman in the desperate pursuit of a wealthy man. It is truly the sad reflection of our libertine age. But I assure you, such fortune hunters are all too common. <sighs> and I do use that term broadly. Bunny! What? I'm merely making conversation. I misspoke earlier. We shall remove ourselves from this house within the week. I've lost my appetite, girls. Come. Oh, oh, oh. It's not that small. It will fit all of us comfortably. And Thomas and Betsy. We really are very fortunate, dear. Where shall I put my telescope? Um, next to my pianoforte. You may spy on the neighbours. Marianne? You may not spy on the neighbours. It is rather small. But I'm sure we shall soon have plenty of money, and then we may think about building. Eleanor, Marianne, and Margaret. <laughs> oh, they are the sweetest girls in all the world. I am sure they left many young, broken gentlemen in Devonshire. <laughs> yes. You must dine with us at Bath. I must We shall not leave until you are in the We shall wait on you for dinner. It's a very convenient. <laughs> Miss Eleanor and Miss Marianne, I must apologize, as, uh, well, I was unable to get any eligible young bachelors here tonight. <laughs> Only our particular friend, Colonel Brandon! <laughs> but he's neither very young nor very gay, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon, oh boy! Come feast your eyes on Miss Eleanor and Marianne Dashwood. <gasps> Brandon. Aren't oh, the sweetest girls in all the world? <laughs> to dinner, to dinner. I only hope, I only hope you won't find it so very dull. Surely 
you can tell us the name of the gentleman who is Miss Eleanor's particular favourite in Sussex? I must not tell. Mar may I, Eleanor? Margaret. Remember that whatever conjectures you may have, you have no right to repeat them. I never had any con conjectures about it. It was you who told me of it yourself. <laughs> Ow. Hey, Miss Margaret, let us know all about it. What is the gentleman's name? I must not tell, ma'am, but I know very well what it is, and I know where he is too. But we can guess where he is in Norland, to be sure. He is the great of the parish, I dare say. He is of no profession at all, oh, Margaret. You know that this is all your own invention, and that there is no such person in existence. Well, then, he is lately dead, Marianne, for I am sure there was such a man once, and his name begins with an F. Oh, oh, my God. God. Do, you, do we Drink. need to shut up? Oh, it, it, it has rained very hard recently. Oh, indeed. It has rained every day for the past fortnight, I believe. Yes. Wouldn't you say the weather has been unusually inclement oh, as of yes. late? Uh, Ma'am. Rain. Shocking. Rain. Yes, it has been a very wet spring. Margaret. Please be so good as to join me at the pianoforte. Why? Uh, Miss Marianne, do you play? <laughs> Please do excuse my sister's enthusiasm. <laughs> no! Pound away by all means! Yes, we're all prepared to be charmed! I'm very fond of music. Colonel Brandon is very much in love with Miss Marianne Dashwood, and I rather suspected it to be so on the first evening when he listened to her sing, and on the second visit when he listened to her sing again. It is an excellent match, for he is rich, and she is handsome, and I'm sure he need not wait any longer. Colonel Brandon is a very eligible bachelor. A bit long in the tooth. Why, my Cassandra set her cap at him. And that was ten years ago! Oh, that great big property inherited! I can't think of it, but I am breathless! Such a sober man. But I suppose a young woman's touch will live in him up! A young pretty woman! Either breathe life into him or kill him within a fortnight! <laughs> a match! A match! A perfect match! I shall find a good husband for every decent woman in the county. Mark my words. <laughs>
Will you go and get your boots on? We're not still going for a walk, are we? It's going to rain. It's not going to rain. Now go and get your boots, please. Oh, boots. Boots, boots, boots. Mama, I have had an alarm on the subject of illness which I must share with you. I am sure that Edward Ferris is not well. Oh? We have been here almost a fortnight and he has not yet come. What else but grave illness could be keeping him away? Does Eleanor expect him? She must. She has said nothing to me. It is all so strange. You know, I purposely left them alone together twice on our last you morning what? at Norland, and each time he unaccountably followed me out of the room. Uh, what? Marianne, are you still walking? It looks as though it may rain. Marianne, it is not going to rain. The day will be everlastingly fair. Now come along. What on earth? Marianne's preserver! Marianne's preserver! Marianne's preserver! Uh, what? <laughs> Pardon the intrusion, ma'am. The lady took a tumble and was not able to stand. Uh, Margaret, run and tell Betsy what has happened. Marianne, dearest, are you in much pain? Only a wrenched ankle, I believe. <laughs> Thank heavens you were there. Please, sir, will you sit and take some tea? Oh, I am dirty and wet. I do not want to ruin your furniture. <laughs> uh, may I ask as to whom we are so obliged? My name is John Willoughby. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope, ma'am, that you will allow me the honour of calling tomorrow to inquire after Miss... Oh, um, Dash... Oh, uh, Dash... Force... Dash... Uh, Dashwood! Uh. <laughs> Sorry, is our name. I am Mrs. Dashwood, and that is Eleanor Mary no, and Margaret Mrs. Mary Ann Dashwood. You'll be very welcome, Mr. Willoughby. Will you not wait for the rain to clear? Oh, my pointers are just outside. A little more rain will not melt me until tomorrow. Marianne's gallant preserver. <laughs> Then when we asked whether he was a down, but he were not, for he was so muddy and dirty, but he is to call again today. Do you know any gentleman by the name of Willoughby? <laughs> Willoughby what? <laughs> yes! He is down here every spring. Oh, I must ask him to dinner on Thursday. And what sort of a young man is he? As good a man as ever lived. Not a bolder rider in all England. And where's his residence? <laughs> <laughs> residence! Mr. Willoughby has no property of his own in this county. He only resides here while visiting mm -hmm. his cousin, Mrs. Smith, at Allenham Court. He, he said to inherit the estate and all the fortune eventually. Oh. <laughs> and if I were you, I would not give him up so easily to my younger sister. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Marianne cannot expect to have all the men to herself. <laughs> Brandon will be jealous if she does not take care. <laughs> My daughters, Sir John, have not been raised to catch gentlemen. <coughs> Pardon me. I am pleased to hear, however, that he is a very respectable young man. Of course he is respectable, Mama. <laughs> I see how it is. You'll be setting your cap at him now and never think of poor old Brandon. <laughs> how can he come? with all of his tumbling about and spra ah, spraining of ankles. Oh. Cooper? Yes. Oh. I dare say that Scott or Pope might be the more serious-minded answer. But I am afraid to say that Cooper is my favourite poet of our time. Cooper may very well be the greatest poet of any time. Pray, Mr. Willoughby, what is your favourite poem? Mine must be hope. I think that Cooper Oh, see me sworn to serve thee. Command a 
painter's skill into a poet's hand. That I, trembling, trace a work divine, fancy may stand aloof from the design. And, and light, light, and shade, and, and every stroke be thine. Uh, Mr. Willoughby, will you join us for dinner? Oh, I beg your pardon, ma'am, but I must be dining with my cousin in Allenham tonight. Gracious, I did not realize it was getting so late. Might I inquire after Miss Marianne again tomorrow? By all means. Until tomorrow. Well, Marianne, no one can ever accuse you of being too reserved. You are right, Eleanor. I am much too at ease, too happy, too frank. I have been open and sincere when I ought to have been spiritless and dull. I suppose you think I should have talked solely of the weather and the roads, and only spoken once every ten minutes. Oh, better yet, never spoken at all. <laughs> My love, she is only teasing you. Eleanor, surely we would never wish to check Marianne's conversations with her new friend. A love match indeed. I hear that Mr. Willoughby visits the Dashwoods every day. Scooping her up in the driving rain. Add a horde of gypsies and you'd have us penny nuts. Married within a month. Mark my word. He has no money to marry. Depends entirely on that old cousin. But when he inherits from her, he will be wealthy indeed. Wealthy and handsome. What's more one way? Look at them. No eyes for anyone else in the world. This is indeed the season of my happiness. But what of poor Colonel Brandon? Colonel Brandon? Oh, Colonel Brandon in his wet spring. <laughs> Colonel Brandon is the type of man whom everyone speaks kindly of and no one cares about. <laughs> Why should you dislike him? Why should you like him? He's very civil. He's seen a great deal of the world and always answers my inquiries with good breeding and good nature. Now just to say that he has told you that in the East Indies the climate is hot and the mosquitoes are troublesome. You are both unfair to him. It is not witty in either of you. Oh, in defense of your protege, Miss Dashwood, even you can be saucy. <laughs> my protege, as you call him, is a very sensible young man and sense will always hold attractions for me. Yes, Marianne, even in a man over 40. Oh yes, he is very respectable indeed. As respectable as a statue. Or monument. <laughs> oh yes, our terribly stiff, perfectly inhuman colonel. I'm surprised he can still bend at the waist. <laughs> well, I have always found him to be a rather perfect gentleman. Oh, but not me. Eleanor! Oh no, your sister is only too right. Forgive me, Miss Dashwood. In utter self-reproach, I cast myself at your feet. To once again bask in the light of your sweet approbation, I surrender my case entirely. I, John Willoughby, confess that Colonel Brandon's character is completely and entirely irreproachable. And yet somehow, I dislike him as much as ever. <laughs> Oh, speak of the devil. We are never safe from him. Ah, oh, you have poor timing, Brandon. You see, I was just about to take Marianne over to the greenhouse. There are some very lovely orchids there. Orchids? Oh, yes, we must go look at the orchids. Oh, I so adore an orchid. Please excuse me, Colonel. Your sister is full of life. <laughs> She's certainly energetic. Someday her disposition will settle, I hope. <laughs> I'm sorry to think of her ever changing. I cannot agree with you there. Marianne's ideals are all very romantic, but they tend to discard propriety entirely. She would benefit from a more mature understanding of certain realities. I do not desire it too much. I once knew a lady who was very like your sister Marianne, and her introduction to what you may call realities was very unfortunate. I will not trouble you with the story. Oh, um, pardon me, have you, have you dropped this? Uh, oh, yes! <laughs> uh, shall I have it laundered? No. I beg your pardon, but you see it is covered with ink. <laughs> Colonel Brandon, please excuse me, may I steal my sister's attention for a moment? Eleanor, I have the most wonderful news! Willoughby has given me a horse! A horse? One which is exactly 
bread to carry a woman. He's sending his groom for it immediately. Marianne, you cannot accept such a present. Why not? Eleanor, we shall share its use. A horse from a strange man. What strange man? We are speaking of Willoughby. And he is very little known to you. Eleanor. I may not have been acquainted with Willoughby for long, but I know him better than I know any other creature in the world. Other than you and Mama, of course. Marianne, let us not touch upon the impropriety for a moment. We cannot afford to keep a horse. Surely we could find we have the enough money. to do to keep ourselves respectable. There must be some way. We must go in for dinner. Mr. Willoughby, I must speak to you about your kind offer. But Marianne! <sighs> Queen Mab is still yours, Marianne. I will keep her only until you can find a more lasting home for her. I still don't want to eat. I know you have to. Okay. You'll see it for me. I will eat it right now. No, John, 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 John. It's mine. Should we sit here? It's John. Oh my gosh. Uh, pardon me, I'm your mother. I like, say, so, hey, if you don't eat it. What's the matter with Brandon? He left my dinner table. Oh, oh yes. If you don't eat it, you lot get You lot know more. Mother. Hey, did you hear what I said? It's going to happen. It's not going to happen. I hope. No, none at all, ma'am. But what was that letter? Merely a letter of business. Then how did it discompose of you so much? Come, let us hear the truth of it. Oh, I know who it is from, and I hope she is well. Whom do you mean, ma'am? Oh, you know who. I am very sorry I received this tonight, ma'am, but I'm afraid it requires my immediate attendance in town to take care of What do you town? have to do in town? And I do not mean to break up this party, but I am afraid I must depart this moment. Tonight? No. Oh, Absurd. Go tomorrow instead. I regret that I cannot. I swear, some people just cannot bear a party of pleasure. No, I would lay 50 guineas that Brandon invented this trick just to get out of our gathering. I have no doubt of it. This is all very unorthodox. Well, when will you come back again? I... Mm -hmm. I dare not say. Your horse is already sir. <laughs> you, you had better change your mind. It is not in my power. Uh, might I see you and your sisters in London this winter, Miss Dashwood? I'm afraid not. Then I must bid you farewell for longer than I should wish. Miss Marianne? I cannot, before you go, do let us know what you're going on about. Good evening, ma'am. How provoking! Well, I can guess what his business is. It is about Mrs. Williams, I'm sure. And who is Miss Williams? She is a relation of the Colonel, my dear. A very near relation. I dare not say how near in fear of shocking you. She is his natural daughter! Oh, indeed! A scandal that happened 15 odd years ago. The mother died, I understand, though we never got quite all the details. He is very fond of his little love child, and I dare say he will leave all the fortune for her. A love child? For old prim and proper Brandon. What a first rate hypocrite! Uh, did Brandon give you any further intelligence? Uh, no, but. But. I assume that it must be something he is ashamed of. <laughs> <laughs> well, despite our reduced numbers, we shall make ourselves merry. What do you all say to a little ramble after dinner? A nice moonlit drive about all the country. Uh, you should ask Mr. Willoughby and Miss Marianne about drives and the country. <laughs> Despite all your tricks, this morning when we all went on a ride and you two sped away out of sight, I used my women inquire of your groom, sir, and I found out 
Where you spent the morning? Yes, out in my carriage. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Impudence. But I have found out where you went in that carriage. I hope you like your future house, Miss Marianne. I look forward to meeting you on Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> A good trick on us, Willoughby. <laughs> now, tell me, have you still got that fine mare? <laughs> Did you really go to Allenham with Mr. Willoughby? Yes. With no companion other than Mr. Willoughby? We did not do anything wrong, Eleanor. <laughs> Mr. Willoughby has perfect right to show that estate. It will all one day belong to him. <laughs> Even if Eleanor was to want to belong to you, Marianne, you would not be justified in what you have done. Eleanor, why didn't you tell me? Why don't you talk to me about Edward? <laughs> There's nothing to tell. Well, the same is true for me. There was nothing to tell, really. We took a little straw. Perhaps it was rather ill-judged of me to go without a chaperone or a formal Im invitation, but Mr. Willoughby wanted particularly to show me privately. There is the sweetest little garden over there, and a sitting room just so particularly put together. He's got tea kettles and tea pots. There's a bit of an engagement, yeah? Did everything Why? Did you submit <laughs> I have such a secret to tell you both about Marianne. I'm sure she'll be married to Mr. Willoughby very soon. <laughs> Margaret, you have said that almost every day since they've met. But indeed now I am sure they'll be married very soon, for he has got a lock of her hair. Ooh. And how do you know? I know many secrets, Eleanor. Margaret? I saw him take it last night after tea, when your mama went out to the room, they were whispering together and he took up a scissors and cut off a lock of her hair and he kissed it and put it into his pocketbook and today she has to stay at him alone i'm sure he must be visiting her now <laughs> margaret it is mr willoughby's cure call outside i told you he did visit her <laughs> marianne uh, um, mr willoughby good day oh well is anything amiss yes <sighs> there has been a very heavy disappointment I'm afraid I am unable to picnic with you today. Oh, well then perhaps tomorrow. Miss Smith has just commanded her poor dependent cousin to conduct some business for her in London right away. I have just received my marching orders and I must leave immediately. Well, her business will not keep you from us long, I hope. You are very kind. But I do not think I will be able to return to Devonshire soon. You see, Miss Smith will not have me more than once per year. And is Alnum the only neighbourhood in which you are welcome? <laughs> For shame, Willoughby. Do you really need a formal invitation to visit us here? You are too good. But my engagements at present are of such a nature that... That... It is a folly to linger. I will not torment myself by remaining any longer. Margaret, please go tell Betty Marianne not to be down for dinner. But I'm pleased, dear. All right. Do you think they have quarrelled? Oh, Eleanor, why do you always love to think the worst? I don't. What else could have happened? Why, it's perfectly obvious. I can account for everything. Can you? Yes. Mrs. Smith must have invented this business in London as an excuse to send Willoughby away. Mm. What has finally reached her of the attachment between Willoughby and Marianne? And she disapproves and strives to separate them. Because he is dependent on her, he dares not confess to her yet that they are already engaged and must obey her wishes for a time. And that is why he cannot predict when he may return. Eleanor, what say you? Nothing. You may be right, Mama. Your countenance suggests that you think otherwise. What are your conjectures? I do not mean to cast suspicion, but Mama, it may indeed be prudent to conceal the engagement from Miss Smith, but why do they conceal it from us? His entire behaviour towards Marianne declares that he considers her as his future wife. My doubts may soon be done away. 
If they write to one another, then they are surely to be engaged. <laughs> A mighty concession indeed, ungracious girl. If you were to see them at the altar, would you then admit they were to be married? Perhaps we should ask Marianne directly if they are to be engaged? You may do as you like. But I would find it very ungenerous to ever force such a confidence. I would not ask that question for the world. Marianne shall tell me what she will, when she will, however she sees fit. I told Betsy she wants to know if she should send Marianne's dinner up. Let us practice your French, dear. Nobody ever tells me anything. Are you going for a walk? Shall I join you? Where would you like to go? On the downs. I'm sorry, Eleanor. I meant to go on the lanes. Marianne, please. You've been avoiding everybody for weeks. Will you take the air with me just once? The sky is very beautiful today. Hmm? Marianne, we never finished reading Marchmont. Perhaps we can pick it up again when Willoughby returns. Although that may not be for many months. Months? No. Nor many weeks. Indeed. Marianne, have you and Willoughby. Eleanor, who is that? Is that Colonel Brandon? No, no, Eleanor, look. Willoughby? No, Eleanor, look. Look, hello! It's us! Yes, hello! Mr. Ferris. Miss Marianne, Miss Edward, Dashwood. Good God, what could have taken you so long? Yes, yes, hello, it's a pleasure to see you both. Uh, indeed, this is almost the greatest happiness ever imaginable. Have you come directly from Norland? No, I was in Devonshire for a fortnight and now come purposely to visit you. Edward, you've been in the county a fortnight and have not yet come. I'm afraid I was visiting with some friends in Plymouth. Well, come. Welcome. Walk back with us. <laughs> Mama will be so excited to finally see you. <laughs> or maybe I should. Ah, uh, Maria, wait. Perhaps we should all walk together. John, Mrs. Jennings, may I present Mr. Edward Ferris? Oh, Mr. F -f 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 Ferris! <laughs> Mr. F -f -f Ferris! <laughs> Please have a seat! What an unspeakable pleasure to meet you! Mr. F -f -f Would anyone care for some tea? You <laughs> would certainly! F -f -f Ferris! Hi, I uh, never saw you wear a ring before, Edward. Is it new? Uh, um, yes. No. It is old, that is, but new to me. Recent. <laughs> Have I never worn it before? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Farris, I've been... Long F. Sir, long F! <laughs> <laughs> Mr. F -f 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 Farris, <laughs> you must dine with us tomorrow night, for we shall be quite... Alone. <laughs> and the night after, you must dine with us as well, for we shall be a large party. And, and perhaps we shall raise a dance in the next week. How long shall we have you in our corner of England, Mr. Ferris? We are quite bereft of young, eligible bachelors. However long you remain a bachelor, that is. Mother! I'm afraid I'm only staying for tonight, ma'am. No! <laughs> What? A lot of riding around for such a short visit. Only for tonight, Edward. Oh, I see. I suppose you came for one particular errand. Oh, oh I see. Uh, I, I, I was in the county, ma'am. Well, whatever your reason, you must stay longer now. Yes, young man, do not be a ninny. Stay! stay. 
Stay. Stay. Really, Edward, you're more than welcome. Stay. 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 I'm afraid I must attend to my mother. <sighs> Truly, Mr. Farrers, such a very short visit. Why come at all? Edward, it's too ridiculous. You must stay. I am sorry beyond what I can say, but I must go to my mother. Oh, well, and what are Mrs. Ferrer's aims for you at present, Edward? Oh, much the same. I am to rise high in the world, but I must find no profession. <laughs> that would be too common. <laughs> Given the choice, I'd like to find employment in the church. Uh, but that is not nice enough for my family. And so my niceties and niceties of my relations make me what I am. An idle, helpless being. Oh, come, Edward, such melancholy. Your mother will give you, in time, the financial independence you're so anxious for. How much good may not a few months do? Well, it may defy many months to produce any good to me. But what is a man if his chief good and markets of his time be but to sleep? and feed. A beast no more! Oh that is from Hamlet, Mary. Oh, but perhaps you did not recognize it given my delivery was so improved. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm saucy. I must be reminded of the past, Edward, and you will never offend me by talking of it. And you still feel the same way about Hamlet's beating heart as you once did, Marianne? In my time of life, opinions are fixed. It is not likely that I should now ever change them. <laughs> Marianne is as steadfast as ever. She's only grown a little more great. Nay, you need not reproach me, Edward. You're not very gay yourself. No, I suppose not. But worse, you are reserved. Reserved? Yes, very. What do you mean? Marianne thinks everybody reserved who's not quite so open as she is. <laughs> well, Edward, I suppose we must now bid you adieu. Do you know when you may return? I'm afraid I cannot say. Do come again, Edward. Soon. Mrs. Dashwood. Mm. Okay, okay. Hello, hello, hello Miss Dashwood. Where's Miss Marianne? Has she run away because we are coming? <laughs> She's out, um, walking. Well, lay that work aside for one moment. Lady industry, <laughs> for I have brought you some strangers. Miss Anne and Lucy Steele, who are to stay with us at the park. How do you like them? Hush, they will hear you. We met them on a morning excursion to Exeter and discovered them to be my relations. Yes. The cousins of my cousins, Mildred's own Mr. John. Uh, nay, not you. A shorter, fuller man, if you please. Very gout, poor fellow, and never comfortable in the least bit of damp. Uh, where was I? Your relations, man. Oh, yes, can you imagine? Naturally, we invited them to stay with us directly. I dare say you can see the resemblance. <laughs> you must come for a visit tonight. You cannot think how you will like them. Oh, oh yes, come. come. You must oh, come. 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 <sighs> A room this is so very well appointed indeed how do you like that chime with dash when i suppose you're very sorry to leave sussex and that big fine house of yours when your father died and you lost your money uh, we were very sad to leave norland excuse me and had you great many sort of dollars over the media basket 
pose the next temperature, but Lord knows if I could have a pose, it might be about to null it. If I have some mustache, which might find adulthood and not have so many as used to have, but perhaps you do not care about the pose that has lived without. For my part, I think they're vastly agree, but for the dress part, behave simple. I can't bear to see them dirty or nasty. Now, the is Miss Rose extra, which Miss Simpson do it mean in morning. He's not fit to be seen. I suppose we're those quick bow mustaches before he married. You're so sorry, Mr. John tells us Miss Marianne, the special admirer, who is very handsome, and I hope you always collect yourself soon. But, perhaps, you have a gentleman friend already. <laughs> His name is Barras, but pray do not tell it, for it's a great secret. Barras? Mr. Barras is a happy man. Your sister-in-law's brother was Dashwood. Why, we know him very, very well. Anne, we have met Mr. Ferris once or twice at her uncle's, but we hardly know him well. Well, I shall say no more. Now, for all the money in the world, I do believe I shall see him in Marianne goes to the Arias. I am passionately fond of an Aria. Miss Dashwood, please pardon me, but I wonder if I might ask you something rather odd. Pray, are you closely acquainted with your sister-in-law's mother, Mrs. Ferris? No, I've never met her. Truly? Oh, I suppose you visited Norland sometimes. I'm afraid not. Oh, you must think me very strange for inquiring about her. I wish I could tell you why I asked, but I do not wish you to think me impertinent. I, I, I could not bear to have you think me impertinent. I'd rather anything in the world than be thought impertinent by a person like you. I assure you. And I, I do wish so much that I could tell you my reasons. And I would indeed be very glad of your advice in a trying matter. But I do not want to trouble you. I am sorry that you do not happen to know Mrs. Ferris. I'm sorry that I do not, but I must confess, I did not know you were at all connected with that family. Forgive me, it was an odd question. Do not think of it any more. Tea? Dearest Miss Dashwood, can I trust you? Um, pardon? C can you, would you, keep a very great and grave and important secret if I unburden myself to you entirely would you solemnly promise never ever ever to tell anyone what I will tell you now uh, uh, Mrs. Ferris is indeed nothing to me at present but the time will come where we may be very intimately connected indeed uh, good heavens have you an understanding with Mr. Robert Ferris. No, I never saw him in my life, but I am engaged to his eldest brother. I dare say he never dropped the smallest hint of it to you or your family. It is a great secret, for I have no fortune, and we fear his mother will take away all his inheritance if he chooses to marry a girl with no money. There must be some mistake. We cannot possibly mean the same Mr. Edward Ferris. I assure you, I am not mistaken about the name of the man on whom all my happiness depends. Mr. Edward Ferris.
Mr. Edward Ferris. We can mean no other. May I ask, is your engagement of long standing? We have been engaged these four years. Four years? Yes, but we have known each other for far longer. He was a pupil for many years with my uncle, Mr. Pratt, who lives in Longstipple. He visited us there recently, in fact. Oh, oh, I suppose just before he visited you here. You are his friends in Plymouth. I am. Oh, no. Did you think him sadly after spirits? Poor Edward. It does break his heart terribly for us to be separated. I gave him a lock of my hair set in a ring. And that was some comfort, he said, but not equal to us being together. Perhaps you noticed the ring when you saw him? Anne! <laughs> Miss Dashwood, I hope we can speak of this again. It is such a relief to confide in someone so much older and wiser. Until now, Anne is the only other person I have been able to ask advice of. And I know my dear Edward cannot be angry at me for confiding in you. He has told me so much about you and your family, and I know he looks upon you quite as his own sister. Might we see you in London this winter? No. I am sorry for that. We could have spent many happy hours together. Anne and I are going in December to see some relations, but I am really going to see my darling Edward. I will, of course, give him your very, very best. My dear Miss Dashwood, gather round! Oh, or Miss Marianne, if you prefer to keep paddling away, but do tend to me closely. Oh, I have a wonderful proposal for you, my girls. Every winter, you know, I get in the habit of removing to a nice and landed near Portman Square, but this year I have been scheming with my little chickens and I have hit upon it. I am entirely resolved to having this go round and round. You both must come with me as my guest to keep an old stupid woman happy. Pam, thank you. It is an excellent plan, <coughs> but I'm afraid we cannot leave our mother. Oh, pooh, she will not object. On the contrary, she will think it be very fit to procure you both a bevy of young English bachelors. <laughs> and Miss Marianne seems eager enough. But, uh, say, our Mr. Willoughby lives in town, does he not? One or the other of you, I must have. I cannot live poking around by myself. Come, Miss Marianne, let us strike hands to the bargain. And if Miss Eleanor changes her mind, by and by, why, all so much the better. <laughs> I am so sincerely thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> I suppose I must ask my mother's consent first, but I assure you, it would be almost the greatest happiness ever imagined. We will consult with Mama, yes, but I think that she will decide against it. It is a wonderful plan. <laughs> I go. May not I go? Perhaps in a few years, my dear. In a few years, I will be beyond all improvement. <laughs> Mama, I do not think this is prudent. Although Mrs. Jennings has a good heart, her protection cannot guarantee us consequences mm, If in Eleanor London. is frightened away by Miss Jennings, Mama, that does not prevent my accepting her invitation what a and enthusiasm. What a sudden display of enthusiasm for Miss Jennings. I will have you both go. These objections are the nonsensical. <laughs> you will enjoy touring London. And if Eleanor would ever condescend to anticipate enjoyment, she might foresee herself having a very interesting time. Don't you think? <laughs> John and Fanny always winter in town and you shall have to visit them. But, perhaps in doing so, you may encounter some other member of the Ferris family? Ferris. <laughs> Mother, I do not deny that I think very highly of Edward Ferris, but that is scarcely a reason to go all the way to London. Must you always be so cold? Marianne. Eleanor. Just... <sighs> Can't you see but that by going to town we may secure both of our happinesses forever? Eleanor, I cannot stand it! I must see Willoughby or I will go mad! Uh, please promise me you'll behave yourself. <laughs>
can. I'm writing home tomorrow. I'm not writing to my mother. Has any letter been delivered for me today? No letter has been left but this. For me? No, ma'am. For my mistress. You are expecting a letter then? No. Oh, you have no confidence in me. Nay, you need not reproach me, Eleanor. You who have no confidence in anyone. Oh, Marianne, again, I have nothing to tell. Our situations are alike then. Neither of us has anything to tell. You because you do not communicate, and I because I conceal nothing. Marianne, we both know that you have my. Eleanor, it's him! Oh, my God. oh it's Colonel Brandon. Miss Dashwood, I am pleased to see you in London. Yes, of course. And you oh, too. Colonel! I am much just glad to see you. Beg your pardon. I have been on my feet all day. <laughs> oh, I have brought two young ladies with me, you see. Well, you see but one of them now, and there is another somewhere, and it is your friend, Miss Marianne Dashwood. Oh, yes, I knew that would please you. I don't know what you and Mr. Willoughby will have to do about the two of you and her. It is a fine thing to be young and handsome. Or well, so I think I never was handsome. Uh, but I was young once. So I seem to remember. Uh, oh, pardon me a moment. Okay, I forgot to speak to the cook about dinner. I have an old cart right to settle with. Lord, I've been busy as a bee. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Uh, might I congratulate you on the acquisition of a brother? What do you mean? Your sister's engagement to Mr. Willoughby. <laughs> if my sister's engaged to Mr. Willoughby, this is the first I've heard of it. Their marriage is universally talked of. Uh, by whom? By some of whom you know nothing, and by some with whom you are most intimate. Well... <laughs> is it true, Miss Dashwood? Uh, I... Though they've never told me of their terms, of their mutual affections, I have no doubts, and I'm not surprised to hear of their engagement. To your sister, I wish all imaginable happiness, and to Willoughby, may he endeavour to deserve her. I cannot you before boiled foils of your cutlets? Honestly, that man? Three weeks had gone by and still no visit from Mr. Willoughby. This must be very teasing to you, Marianne. But at the Fitzgerald Ball tonight, there will be plenty of young men to attend upon you, and I am sure Mr. Willoughby will turn up sharpish when he hears about all the gentlemen that you've danced with tonight. Easy. Easy. Uh, okay. Buttons. Oh my gosh, the last time we could run buttons. Terrible, terrible. I'm so sad. I don't care. Don't care. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into a ball, mate. Yes, I can't. It's nice to see you. I know. I guess. It's going to be a while. Sure. Will it be? Oh, it's it's so cool. 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 Uh, Miss Dashwood. Good God, will you not shake hands with me? I do hope your mother is well. Have you not received my letters? For heaven's sake, Willoughby, what is the matter? Yes, I have received the information about your arrival in town. But you were so good as to send me. Please excuse me. Marianne. Oh, pray, pray be composed. Do not betray what you feel to everybody. Do not go to him this moment. Oh. Force him to come to me. Marianne, no. I'm not in front of all these people. No, no. I'm unwell. Oh, Very unwell. Listen. Oh, Marianne, listen. You must be very cool.
something from a certain special someone which I am sure you will find to your liking. Uh, I have never seen a young woman so desperately in love in my entire life. Pray, when are they to be married? Uh, Ma'am, you do not surely think that they are to be married? I always thought you were joking. For shame, Miss Eleanor. How can you talk so? We all know that they were madly in love from the moment that they met. Because you are so sly about it, personally you think nobody else has any sense at all. But I assure you, everybody knows of it. From here to Devonshire and back again. I tell everyone of it myself. Indeed, ma'am. You are very mistaken. And you are doing a very unkind thing in spreading the report. Oh, yes. You are very subtle and... Clever creature, Miss Eleanor! Um, Mum's the word until bands are red, but I'm off to see my Charlotte, but I've asked Susan to lay out a nice breakfast for the two of you. to stop yourselves! Ta-ta! Oh, <sighs> my dear madam, I gather that something in my behaviour last night did not meet with your approval although I'm at a loss as to how I may have offended you. Allow me to be plain. I am sorry if you ever mistook my friendship for something more, but you must acknowledge that anything of that nature is and has been impossible, as my affections have been long engaged with another young lady, John Willoughby. gone on for much longer. What engagement? Yeah. You weren't engaged, but Marianne, you wrote to him. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. What do you do, my dear? <laughs> Poor thing. She looks very bad. <laughs> no wonder. It is all but too true. He is to be married very soon. Mrs. Taylor told me of it downstairs and I almost sank on the spot. Well, said I, if this is true, he has used a woman of my acquaintance abominably ill, and I wish with all my soul that she may plague his heart out. <laughs> but Miss Marianne, he's not the only man with having. Soon you will be beating them back with a stout <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Have your little cry out. <laughs> Luckily, the Parrys and the Sandersons will be here tonight, and they will amuse her. My dear ma'am, I am certain that Marianne will not be coming out of her room tonight. I cannot believe that a man would use such a pretty woman so ill. But when there is plenty of money on one side and none on the other. <laughs> the lady then, is she very rich? Fifty thousand pounds, my dear. The young Miss Grey, a stylish girl they say, but not handsome. Uh, Fifty thousand pounds, and it doesn't come before it is it wanted, for he is all to pieces. Tis a true saying about an ill wind, but it will be all the better for Colonel Brandon. <coughs> How will chuckle when he hears this news? They'll be married by midsummer. Well, one shoulder of money, you know, drives the other down. <laughs> all she wants is gossip, and she only likes me because I supply her with it. Marianne, I do not want to talk. <sighs> I will leave you alone. If you promise to get some rest. I recollected that I had some old Castantia wine in the house, so I brought a glass of it for your sister. My poor husband was quite fond of it whenever he had a touch of his gout. Thank you, ma'am. You are very good. Mrs. Jennings is not at home, Colonel. And your sister? She's unwell. Perhaps then, what I heard this morning, there may be more truth in it than I thought possible. What did you hear? It... It concerned a certain gentleman. Oh. 
You mean Mr. Willoughby's sudden engagement to Miss Grey? Have you also heard that she has fifty thousand pounds? Ah. How is your sister? Her sufferings have been very severe. Miss Dashwood, I may be able to offer some comfort. Uh, no, not comfort, but I may be able to relate some history about Mr. Willoughby that may bring some clarity. Please, do go on. You may find me to be a very awkward narrator. <sighs> Please. In my youth, I knew a lady who was very like your sister Marianne, both in person and in temperament. I loved her and she loved me in return, but Eliza had no fortune. I was a young man with no independence and no occupation. I was under my father's power. <coughs> he forbade the match, of course. A marriage of that kind was impossible, he said, unthinkable. And though I protested violently, I'm ashamed to say he won his point at the last. Threatened with disinheritance and disownment. I faltered, and Eliza was sent away. At seventeen, I was also shipped off to my regiment in the East Indies. There, I lost contact with Eliza entirely. A, a man came along and treated her kindly for a time. And then another. Then another. I returned to England, a grown man, independent, determined to find her, but, but by the time I did, she was dying in the poorhouse, her infant by her side. You may have heard some rumors about my ward, Miss Jane Williams. She is Eliza's daughter, whom I swore to look after as my own. That was 15 years ago. Last February, Jane suddenly disappeared from her boarding school. For months, I could not find her. Finally, I received a letter from her. On that evening, I left Barton so suddenly. In it, she did not name the man who had seduced her. His luck, for I would have done him violence at the table, e even as he basked in your sister's smiles. Mr. Willoughby. He left Jane in a situation of utmost distress, with no home, no help, no friends, ignorant of his whereabouts. She is 15, and now she is with child. This is beyond everything. When I came to you last week, Miss Dashwood, I thought all was settled between your sister and Mr. Willoughby. I did not know how I could stop the marriage without heaping scandal upon both her and my poor Jane. Who knows what his intentions on Marianne were? I promise you, Miss Dashwood, if I did not, from my heart, believe that this may eventually lessen Miss Marianne's regrets, I would have never burdened you with such troubling information. I am sure I keep you from your sister. Marianne, before I write to Mama, there's something I need to tell you. I heard his creditor has breathed much easier. I heard Miss Grey wore orange blossoms to their wedding. <coughs> orange blossoms at this time of year? They say that Miss Dashwood is broken hearted and very ill. They had been for a so Indeed? Oh, yes. She wrote to him openly. Very forward of her. No one to keep her in check. Your father's dead, you know. Well, what's he you expect? I heard they went out writing alone. I am sure all the Dashwood girls run quite wild. Then what did she expect? Silly girl. Very forward. Very foolish. What a waste. And so you see, we never really knew Willoughby at all. I would sooner be deceived by all the world than by Willoughby. Uh, he's practiced nothing but deceit from beginning to end. I cannot explain his behavior towards that poor girl. But whatever his sins, I know that he loved me. He loves me. That much is true. Did he tell you that he loved you? Yes. He loves me. That much is true. No. He never 
Absolutely, it does not matter. Marianne, of course it does. He's the worst kind of villain. No, he isn't. It not not at heart. You say that we never knew him, Eleanor, but I did. I know him as I know myself. Perhaps if he is wicked, then so am I. He and I are the same. You are being ridiculous. You do not understand. Perhaps I don't. He and I are the same. You are being ridiculous. Marianne, how could you have written to him? I felt myself to be as solemnly engaged to him as if the strictest legal covenant had bound us. Well, obviously, he did not feel the same. He did, Eleanor. I may have been cruelly used, but not by Willoughby. By who else but Willoughby? I do not know. I may have been cruelly used, Whoever may have been your enemy, let them be cheated of your triumph by seeing them. you rise above these circumstances. I care not who knows that I am wretched. It is easy for those who have no sorrow to talk of calmness and exertion. It is easy for those Do you think I have no sorrow? Can you believe me capable of being calm while I see you in this state? Forgive me. I know that you feel for me, and I'm very sorry to make you unhappy. But mine is a misery which nothing can ever do away. But mine is a misery. I want to go home. to see you in town. Benny and I wanted to stop in you earlier, of course, but we've been very busy visiting and being visited. Visit, 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 visit. Oh, whatever's the matter with Mary Ann? She looks very unwell. She has had a nervous complaint. Oh, I am so sorry for that. Any sign of illness at her age destroys the bloom forever. Too thin. Too pale and thin. She's not that thin. Too pale. Fanny used to say that Marianne would certainly marry better than you did. But the way she looks now, <laughs> I doubt she'll catch a man worth more than five or six hundred a year. Oh, you will excuse me, twittering about marriage like an old dowager. But it's all we've been speaking of in our household. It's finally time, you know, for Edward to settle. Is Mr. Ferris going to be engaged? It has not been entirely battened down yet. But his mother has determined that she will give him his independence as long as he marries the Honorable Miss Morton! <laughs> What does Mr. Ferris think of the arrangement? I'm not sure if she's told him yet. No doubt he'll be delighted. It's a perfect match. But that's all to come. In the meantime, we'd like to invite you to a little dinner party. Oh, you must attend. Benny is wild to see you. Miss Steele. Miss Dashwood. Miss Marianne. Oh, look, Lucy! It's our particular friends! How do you happen to find yourselves in this company? I may as well ask the same thing of you. I confess that I am amazed to see you. For you told me, you know, that you would not ever come to town at all. And yet, here you are. Why are you here? Why are we too and your sister-in-law are the best of friends? Yes, last week we were at the sweet little miller shop up Bradley Street. We fell to talking to a table of a lady waiting there and chatting about a boy who has been quite the monkey with a friend. And I thought, and after that, I was it. And we too, and your sister-in-law are the best of friends, yes. Last week we were at the sweet little miller shop up Bradley Street. And we fell to talking to a terribly elegant lady waiting there and chatting about a boy who has been quite the monkey with a friend. Oh, the most of fate and Lucy. And that's why we children one day led to another and to that elegant lady was Mrs. John Dashwood. And we have been almost every day since then. And she was the party of Mrs. John Here we are. We have been almost every day since then. I see you have discovered each other. Here we are. Oh, I see. What a small world that you are such friends already. Come, let me introduce you. Miss Dashwood, pray for me. In a moment, I shall meet the person that is to be my mother. Our host, Mrs. Ferris. Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Ferris says that the Miss Steeles are exceedingly pretty. Miss Dashwood? 
Robert Baz. You reside in Devonshire, I am told, in a cottage. We do. <laughs> For my part, I am excessively fond of a cottage. There is always so much eloquence in a cottage. If I have any money to spare, I should build a cottage and have all my friends come visit me. <sighs> in my cottage. <laughs> I advise everybody I see to build a cottage. Oh, my intimate friend, Lord Lancashire, of Lancashire Courtlands, came to me the other day and laid before me three different architectural plans. Which one should I build, Robbie? said he. My dear Courtlands, said I, throwing them directly into the fire. Build none of these deplorable shacks, but by all means, build a... A cottage, man! A cottage, cottage, cottage! <laughs> and that was the end of that. <laughs> Indeed. And you, Miss Steele, do you live in a cottage as well? I do not. More's the pity. <laughs> and that is Edward's brother. They are very unlike. Miss Dashwood, I cannot thank you enough for your invitation to dine tonight. Anne and I are quite overwhelmed by your generosity. I only hope we do not intrude. Oh, Miss Lucy, how could a charming creature such as you ever intrude? Indeed, Mother. Mother says how unusual it is nowadays to encounter such modest and respectful girls as the Lejolets, Miss Steeles. I assure you, my dear, young ladies of your sort are always welcome here. Oh, Mrs. Ferris, you are too kind. I could just stay here forever. Your home is so lovely. Those sketches on the wall, so well executed. Did you draw them, Miss Dashwood? These were done by Eleanor. You know, we should ask Miss Morton to paint something for us. She does paint most delightful. Beautifully indeed, but she does everything well. Who is Miss Morton? Why are you talking about Miss Morton? Eleanor made those and they are beautiful. Miss Morton is Lord Morton's daughter. Shall we go in for dinner? Dear, dear Eleanor, don't mind them. Please don't let them upset you. Exactly. Did you not see Mrs. Ferris's way of treating me yesterday? So exceedingly affable, so kind from the moment I was introduced. She really seemed to take a special fancy to me. Were you not quite struck with it? She was certainly very civil towards you. Did you see nothing but civility? If the Ferris family knew about your engagement, nothing could be more promising than their treatment of you. But as that is not the case. Why in the world would they pretend to like me if they did not? Mrs. Ferris is affability itself, and so is your sister-in-law, and I think it will all work out splendidly, and that all my fears were for nothing. I suppose time will tell. Why did you never mention, Miss Dashwood, how exceedingly charming your sister-in-law is? She is generosity itself. She wrote Anne and I a little note this morning and invited both of us to stay with her for a bit. Isn't that very delightful? Are you ill, Miss Dashwood? You seem rather low. I have never been in better health. Really? You do not look it. Oh, I am so glad his mother loves me already. I would have given up all hope if she had treated me in a forbidding sort of way and made it clear that I was unwelcome. For when she does dislike people, I know it is most unshakable and violent. 
Ashwood, Miss Neil, uh, please uh, do be seated. I, uh, I thank you, Miss Dashwood. I, I came to inquire after your mother. Uh, she's very well, thank you. Excellent. Excellent. And your Miss Margaret, your sister. Uh, very well, very well, thank you. <laughs> uh, Edward, I heard you announced. Miss Marianne. How do you do? Oh, I am very unwell. But don't think of me, Edward. Eleanor is well, and surely that is all that matters. It's not, it's not London agree with you. Not at all. I expected to find much pleasure here, but the sight of you is the only comfort it has afforded thus far. Ah. We spent such a terrible, wretched day at Harley Street yesterday, Edward. I have so much to tell you about it, which cannot be said at the moment. <clears throat> But why weren't you there? I'm afraid I was engaged elsewhere. Engaged elsewhere? When such friends were to be met? Perhaps, Miss Marianne, you think that young men never keep any engagements at all. Not so indeed. I am sure that Edward must have had something very important to do to keep him from us. Did you have some pressing previous obligation, Edward? Marianne, I, 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 I knew it. What else could have kept him away? Edward really has the most active conscience in the whole world and would only have disappointed us because he did not want to break his vow to another. Indeed, he is the most fearful of failing expectations or causing others pain of anybody I have ever met. And he always tries to do the right thing. Edward, it is so and I will Excuse say- Excuse me, I have only come for a moment. I have an appointment to see a horse. To buy. I may buy the horse, if it is a good horse. Going so soon? Again? Edward, this must not be. I'm afraid I must also be on my way. If you are leaving, Mr. Ferris, perhaps you'd be so good as to escort me as far as the park? I... Why, yes. Delighted. Miss Marianne? Miss Dashwood? What could have brought her here? Could she not see that we wanted her gone? How teasing to Edward. Why so? We are all his friends and he has known Lucy the longest. I'm sure he was very happy to see her. You know, Eleanor, I cannot bear when you say things that you know are not true. Miss Dashwood! Miss Marianne, have you heard the news at your sister's? Ceteria van Sushi marvelously, my dear Trejolet. Very, Very pretty. Oh, she says something about Trejolet. Just random, you know. She tries to get to Oh, you young ladies in your bows, it is all so diverting. But you must not keep every heart for yourself, Miss Anne. You must leave some suitors for dear Miss Lucy. Pray tell. Now, Miss Anne, Miss Lucy and yourself are family to me, and I am afraid we commit no secrets in this family. I will ask you again, Madame, who is the lucky gentleman and where is his lodging? No, no, I shall not be put off so easily. She won't care, I tell you. She's engaged, Anne! She screams at Anne. And then tells her to who? She tells her to who? She tells her to who? Your sister-in-law threw them out of the house in fanatic fits, and your brother sent for Dr. Donovan, and Dr. Donovan found the house in an uproar, and now the story is all over town. Uh, Miss Marianne, are you ill? What?
Marianne, I knew. Has Edward written to you? Uh, Lucy told it to me herself, and swore me to secrecy before I knew what I was promising. Four months? And yet you do love him? Yes, but I do not love only him. I was glad to spare my loved ones for my unhappiness. How could Edward be engaged to that creature? People make mistakes, Marianne. Edward was very young when he met Lucy, and as confined as he was by his mother and upbringing, I'm sure she was very refreshing. She is lively and can make herself agreeable when she wishes. And if, when he began to grow older, he noticed something of her true nature, I'm sure he was too honourable to break off the engagement. Edward, as we have always said, has the most active conscience. But his behaviour towards you... I must you. acquit Edward of all essential misconduct. Eleanor. He never promised me anything! It's not his fault we got carried away by our own conjectures. I am sure that he feels something for you. Even if that is true, there's nothing to be done about it. Edward will marry Lucy and I truly wish them very ha happy. If your way of thinking is so practical, I'm not surprised that you are calm. I understand. You do not suppose that I've ever felt much. For four months, Marianne, I have known of Edward's engagement. For four months, I have had to listen to Lucy's hopes and exultations again and again. For four months, I've been able to confide in no one. I am to be divided from Edward forever. Nothing has ever proved him unworthy. And I'm beginning to think that now he may perhaps feel something, as you say. In short, I've suffered all the extreme punishment of extreme attachment without being able to enjoy any of its advantages. If you believe me capable of feeling anything, Marianne, know that I have felt this loss very deeply. My current composure is the product of my constant and painful exertion to maintain control over myself. I have done my duty, but believe me, I have been very, very unhappy. Uh, Eleanor, promise me something. Anything. Please promise not to speak with the least appearance of bitterness to anyone who may inquire. Speak civilly and discreetly to anyone. Yes, even Edward and Lucy. But please. I yes, of course. You have heard, I suppose, of the very shocking discovery that took place under our roof yesterday. Shocking? Appalling! Absurd! Fanny says she shall never think well of anybody ever again after being so deceived. I now wish, said poor Fanny, that we'd even had your sisters to stay with us instead of the Steels. <laughs> Why, thank you. Generous. Most generous. Hmm. We sent for Edward, but I am sorry to relate what happened. His mother explained to him that she would give him his independence if he would simply give up the girl and marry Miss Morton. Told him she'd even give him the Norfolk estate, which brings in a good thousand or so a year. That is true. But if he were to marry Miss Steele, she would disown him entirely. And if he were to try to find any profession at all, she would do everything she could to keep him from advancing in it. Gracious God! Well, may you explain, Marianne? And Mrs. Fetter's generosity. Edward said very little, but what he did say was very unfeeling to his mother and sister, who strove with all their might to help him see the error in his ways. He refuses to give up the engagement. Don't ruin him! He has acted like an honest man. I beg your pardon, Mr. Dashwood, but I have some concern in the business, for Lucy Steele is my relation. I do not mean to speak disrespectfully of any of your connections, madame. But you know, in the present case, the match is impossible. Well, sir, and how did it end? What is to happen? Did his mother cast him off? Is he ruined entirely? Oh, I am so sorry to say it ended in a most unhappy rupture. 
Edward will be dismissed from Mrs. Ferris' notice forever and will be <laughs> disinherited. His mother, with a very natural kind of spirit, has decided to give it all to Robert immediately. Thus ends Edward Ferris, the great untrappable rich bachelor. How does he propose to marry anyone now that he's penniless? Impossible! And Mr. Robert Ferris is a rich man. A very rich man. And very unmarried. <laughs> <laughs> It is, indeed, a very grave situation. I see the, na the natural anxiety upon all of your faces. But not to worry, there has been no material danger done to Fanny. Though she suffers severely, the angel. <sighs> this town gets worse every year. Bad behavior all around. But thank heavens we'll be back in Barton soon. Only stop for a quick visit with my daughter Charlotte in Cleveland, but then back home as quick as you please. Cleveland? No, I cannot go to Cleveland. Oh, because Mr. Willoughby owns property in the county. Indeed, they are Irma's neighbors. I think one can see his house from here on Charlotte's estate. I am sorry, but you will never see him again. I have told Charlotte all about his wicked treatment towards you, and her dear Mr. Palmer would shoot him like a pheasant on sight. You will be very safe, I assure you. Ma'am, thank you. We would be happy to go with you. It is an excellent plan. Excuse me. Eleanor, you cannot make me go! Marianne, we will only be there a few days. We shall remain in the house the entire time. I promise there is no chance that you will see him. We may even ask Colonel Brandon if he would escort us back from there. Please, it is the quickest, most eligible way in but for us to return. And you know we are both eager to be gone. I would be honoured to escort you whenever you wish to leave the Palmers. <coughs> uh, Miss Dashwood, I must speak to you about another matter. I have heard of the injustice that your friend Mr. Ferris has suffered, and I wondered if I may be of some use. How so? They say Mr. Farris intends to enter the church. The living of Delaford is vacant and mine to a point. Would you be willing to tell him that I would name him as rector if he thinks it's worthy of his acceptance? I only wish it were more valuable, but it is enough for him to marry upon. That is very generous, Colonel. But wouldn't you rather offer him the position yourself? I do not know him well, Miss Dashwood. I've only met him two or three times. I should think as you are his old friend, he would be more inclined to hear the happy news from you. Miss Dashwood, I received a note from Mrs. Jennings that you wish to speak with me. Yes, hello. Yes, um, I am charged with a most agreeable offence. Our dear friend, Colonel Brandon, has desired me to say, uh, understanding you mean to take order, he has great pleasure in offering you the living of Delaford. <laughs> allow me to congratulate you and to join his wishes in that it may allow you to establish all your views of um, domesticity. Colonel Brandon? The Colonel has heard of your troubles and wishes to help in any way that he can, as do we all. C Colonel Brandon? Giving me a living? <laughs> the unkindness in your family has made you astonished to find kindness anywhere. No. I am sure I owe this to you. You are mistaken. I have had no hand in it. Uh, not that I wouldn't have had a hand in it. Had if I had had a hand to give in it. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Ashwood, when I first met Miss Lucy Steele, I was very young and quite... quite stupid, really. Colonel Brandon lodges, I think, on St. James Street. I believe so. Then I must go to thank him. Uh, may I... Um, may I offer you my unceasing good wishes for your happiness. And mine yours. Miss Dashwood.
introduce Charlotte, the prettiest of my daughters. Charlotte, you've grown so plump. Oh. I am so stiff from the carriage. I may take a little walk around the grounds. Oh, but it's getting so late, and it looks as though it may rain. Wait only until tomorrow, and then I will join you. It is not going to rain, Eleanor. I will go mad if I do not walk. I will return soon. Violet's complaint. No, a fever, they say, and very serious. My father died from the same, you know. That stock was never strong. Dying of a broken heart. Such a rapid decay. They say the doctor has been there four times in two days. The Palmers have removed themselves, lest it be contagious. Well, that's the sad end of the whole affair, I suppose. And her so young. Poor Miss Dashwood. Poor Miss Dashwood. Poor Miss Dashwood. Poor Miss Dashwood. Eleanor, is Mama coming? Not yet. We will send for her, but it may take some time but for her to get to She must not go by London. Uh, I shall never see her if she goes by London. Marianne. No, I'm hot. I'm too hot. Doctor, she is not herself. I will bleed her. I shall hold the bowl. Oh, Miss Dashwood, uh, I would prefer if you would send a man in. I cannot have you fainting. <sighs> Miss Dashwood. I think it might be best if your mother was sent for. Soon. Is she going to die? I must dispatch a messenger to Barton. My mother must come as soon as possible. With your permission, I will deliver the letter myself. It will be faster and I will bring her back with me directly. That's not necessary, Colonel. Miss Dashwood, please give me something to do. I will bring your mother back with me. Look for us before 10 o'clock. Marianne, can you hear me? I will not stand for it. You are being ridiculous. I did not mean it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I promise if you ever wake up, I will never charge you again. Marianne, please. Marianne, you cannot leave me here. You cannot leave me alone. Miss Dashwood. Your business cannot be with me, sir. The servants must have forgotten to tell you that Mr. Palmer is not at home. Had they told me that the Palmer and his relations were at the devil, it would not have turned me from the door. How is your sister? You have no right to ask. Mr. Willoughby! Forgive me. <laughs> I have been drinking. What do you want? 
I want to make things right again. I want something like, like forgiveness from Marianne. Marianne, you should not be so familiar. Are things as bad as they say? Is she dying? It's my fault, I know. Please let me see her. No. I never planned any of this. I never wanted to hurt anyone. I must ask you to leave. When I first met your sister, I only wanted but an idle dalliance. Something to do in the country. Mr. Willoughby! I mean, you misunderstand me. I thought it was but only a harmless flirtation. And at first I thought that surely Marianne also understood that it could lead to nothing. You must see that it was impossible for a man such as me to seriously pursue a girl with no fortune, no station, forgive me, no notable family. But quite against my intentions, the part I played became the most pressing reality. I found myself terribly in love. Did you? I was going to ask her to marry me. And what precisely stopped you? You must think me very foolish indeed. Miss Smith was somehow informed of a regrettable connection in my past. I know your history, Mr. Willoughby. And I can guess who might have told you. But ask yourself if he is truly impartial. Yes, I ought to have never touched Jane. But do not suppose that because I was a libertine, she was a saint. Any weakness on her part is no excuse. I assure you, Miss Ashwood, I have paid richly for my sins. Miss Smith has pronounced me no gentleman, and I have been summarily disinherited, and I have many debts. Should I have gone to prison? I had no practical choice but to give up Marianne. When you left Marianne that day, did you tell her you would soon return? I don't know what I told her. I was out of my head. I had to resolve to forget her entirely. <laughs> well, you did an excellent job. You ignored her letters, shunned her in public, and exposed her to the worst kind of gossip and intrigue. Is this all proof of the great love you have borne her? Everything had already been settled between Miss Gray and I. <sighs> well, then you have made your choice, and you will be held to it. Goodbye. I must see her! Seeing you will endanger her recovery. Recovery? <laughs> her fever broke last night. She is no longer in material danger. You have been very cruel, Miss Dashwood. As have you. <laughs> well, you needn't punish me anymore. I'm unhappy enough as it is. My marriage alone is just reward for my folly. You should not speak of your wife in that way. I shouldn't, should I? Yet. If ever on thine eyelids stood a tear that pity had endangered, drop one here. This man was happy once, but conscience has her part, and writes a doomsday sentence upon his heart. Hope, the poem. Cooper. You really should leave. Yes. I will before I make you hate me entirely. But Miss Dashwood, will you someday repeat to your sister the things I have been telling you? Tell her my heart was never unfaithful to her. Oh, but Marianne is most likely lost to me forever. But were I someday by some blessed chance Mr. free... Mr. Willoughby. Yes. Well... Goodbye, Miss Dashwood. God bless you. Willoughby. That's good. I do pity you. Brandon, you shall never know what it has meant to me. Oh, if it 
is not any imposition, Colonel. Could you stay? My voice is very weak and tired from the stress of yesterday's journey, but perhaps you could read to Marianne. We must make her confinement an interesting one. <laughs> He loves her, of course. <laughs> Judging from his spirits, he does not think there's much hope. He thinks Marianne's affections and opinions too deeply rooted for any change, and even supposing her heart free again, does not believe he could ever attach her. Did you know, Colonel, that Shakespeare writes in a rhythm which matches precisely the beats of a human heart? Bum, 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 bum. Um. <laughs> and he was drinking. Yes, but I think that he meant it all. Marianne, may I ask? Yes? Do you now perceive that marriage to Willoughby would have condemned you to continual unhappiness? Can you imagine being bound to someone so endlessly selfish? Do you think him selfish? The whole of his behaviour from the beginning to the end of the affair was based on selfishness. His own pleasure in every particular is his ruling principle. I suppose my happiness was never his object. At present, he regrets marrying for money. And why does he regret it? Because it has not made him perfectly happy. But had he married you, Marianne, he would have always been poor, suffering all of poverty's attendant evils. He's already proven that he's capable of treating you with great cruelty and indifference when it suits his purposes. In those circumstances, who knows how you might have fared? Eleanor, I agree with you. Are you surprised? <laughs> A little. <laughs> I'm glad that we can speak about it. I'm relieved to hear that he was not always acting a part, not always deceiving me. It makes me feel not quite such a fool. I think... I may even understand how he justified his actions entirely. Do you still acquit him? No. I see everything as you desire me to, I assure you. He was very wrong in what he did. And I could never have been happy with him after knowing what he did to that unfortunate girl. But I also feel sorry for him. Is that very foolish? No. No. Not at all. I'm grateful that you told me. I don't regret anything, except my own behavior. Do you compare your behavior with his? No. I compare it with what it ought to have been. I compare it with yours. Well, you are a goose. <laughs> are you tired? Ah, uh, no. The, the Colonel has promised to read me The Tempest this evening, and I don't wish to be late. Hmm. <laughs> He's very good! <laughs> No, no, I'm fine. 
Oh, who told you that Mr. Ferrers was married, Thomas? Well, I just saw his new bride. Miss Steele, as was, yes. She and Mr. Ferrers were stopping in a chaise outside of the new London Inn. She said hello and has sent her best to the family, especially Miss Eleanor, and I'm afraid to wish her joy. But she told you she was married, Thomas? Yes. She smiled and said she was Mrs. Ferrers now. And Mr. Ferrers was with her. I didn't see him, but I imagine he's well enough for she seemed vastly contented. Eleanor, I... <laughs> oh, Margaret, go and please just pick some pretty flowers for us, will you? Oh, yes. <laughs> Mama, Colonel Brown is at the gate. Oh, for tea. It's That's not the Colonel! What? It's Edward! Oh my god, it is Edward! You sit! Sit! Oh. Edward! Hello! I do wish you joy. Ma'am? I, uh, do hope you've left Mrs. Farrers very well. Oh, rather well, I think. Yes. Hmm. And is, um, Mrs. Farrers at Youngsterpool? No, uh, my mother is in town. <laughs> uh, um, I meant to inquire after Mrs. Edward Farrers. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps you mean Mrs. Robert Farrers? Robert Ferris. Robert. Robert. Mrs. Robert Ferris? Perhaps you do not know. You may not have heard that my brother is recently married to Miss... to Miss Lucy Steele. Your brother? Yes. I had a letter from Miss Steele. Uh, now Mrs. Robert Ferris, she... they struck up an acquaintance and well, my brother, he's very popular now, you know, because of his inheritance and she set her cap at him, as I believe they say, and they were married last week. Miss Dashwood, you must allow me to tell you how ardently I, I am sensible to the improprieties of from the moment I first laid eyes on you. Oh, Eleanor. If I loved you any less, I might be able to say more about it. <laughs> Mr. Ferris! Mr. Ferris, your behavior in this has been very wrong. <laughs> very wrong. Very blamable. Miss Dashwood, when I first met Miss Lucy Steele, I was a foolish, idle, ignorant young man. I was not allowed to choose a profession. I had nothing to do but fancy myself in love. <laughs> but, but your behavior towards I me... I was simple enough to think that because my faith was already pledged to another, there would be no harm in me being with you. And then when I knew I was in love, I thought, the danger, it's, it's only my own. Doing no harm to anybody but myself. Uh, Mr. Ferris, I... But, but won't you forgive me, darling? Dearest Eleanor, please. Won't you be mine? <laughs>